Welcome back, everybody, to yet another episode of Two Chaps Many Cultures, the show about the business of culture and the culture of business. And in business that touches different cultures, you may find yourself crossing over into another culture, remaking your career in a different location. And that may not always be as easy as it looks in the brochure that your employer gave you, because expatriate careers are not always clean cut and they don't always follow a template. And how do you plan your career abroad? That is a topic that you may want to pay attention to. And we will have somebody who is an expert in this. So stay tuned. told me there'd be a brochure where's my brochure <laughs> maybe you didn't get one you were not important enough I wasn't <laughs> important enough well i did it on my own so maybe i should have just um written my own how about that you know yeah. that I been nice. once wrote a brochure for one of the clients that was the first time that they were sending people abroad and they asked me to um put together a um i don't know it was like a 60 70 page um, guide to entering that location. It was a big flashy brochure that we put together for that client. And a part of that was um, how you're going to reinvent your career. And it was not necessarily the expats themselves that the company sent on the assignment. It was their husband and wives. It uh -huh. was a so-called accompanying spouse who found themselves in a situation where they were not quite sure what's going to happen to me professionally. Maybe they had to push a pause button on their career in order to accompany their spouse to go on this assignment. And what does that do to your resume? What does that do to your professional career, your development? And that is something that needs special attention. And we have somebody that is special and gives it that attention. Right? Absolutely. Look at that. Well done. <laughs> so let's welcome her to the Two Chaps Mini Culture Studio. Welcome, Tracy Oyekanmi. How are you doing today? Hi, Two Chaps. Hi, Christian. Hi, Brett. It's so exciting to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for being here. Now, what do you do to help people who work abroad make their career or make a career at all or continue their career yes so i am the founder of visible at work it's a platform for highly skilled international uh executives and foreign trained professionals to stand out at work mainly for a lot of people who work in corporate and you would notice that for some their companies move them so the company provides the training the support and then there are some other people that take that mm -hmm. leap of faith and move on their own to experience another culture, um, to mm -hmm. get more uh, work experience, maybe with a new division. And they do not have that support. They already have the hard skills, the technical skills to do the job. Um, but when either you move into a leadership position, then you find that, that it's not just about what you know, but how you can inspire people to take action. And that's where I come in, in helping such executives to be able to plan and be better prepared for um, when they move abroad or when they work on global teams. We also have a podcast as well called Visible at Work, uh, Spotify, Anchor, you know, iTunes everywhere, um, talking about careers. Visible at Work. And um, I think I should put that in a banner here, visible at work, so people know what it's called. So, Tracy, where, where do you do this work? Do you do this anywhere, or are you predominantly focused on a certain geographic footprint? Um, so, for now, we are mainly focused on people that uh, either relocated to the US or Canada. Um, we also have, once in a while, we have clients from other parts of the world. 
Um, personally and professionally, I in uh, my corporate role, I had done training and managing for uh, teams in Asia, in uh, North America, in Europe, and in the Middle East as well. So I have that breadth of experience uh, dealing with clients from those parts of the world. Um, but apart from that, like we're visible at work, most of our clients are within US and Canada. And you're based in Vancouver, BC, right? Yes, I am. All right. So um, have you had to do this for yourself or for family members, um, this career abroad experience? Have, have, have you gone through that experience yourself? Uh, so, yes, I will wear that badge of honor. <laughs> um, it, it's funny how when I started as part of my communications role in corporate, I was doing that for a lot of executives. And, you know, there's a difference between like the theory aspect of it, it's supporting people, of course, you know, they're doing a lot of stuff. But when you now get to be in your shoes, going for a holiday is totally different from going to work somewhere else. And um, I did that myself. So personally, I have also helped myself to reinvent my career, to reinvent myself, um, moving from, from Nigeria to the US and then to Canada. Mm -hmm. And also I've been doing that like uh, unofficially for a lot of friends and other people. And, and you know, a lot of people kept asking for support and that's why we decided to branch out and now have this at work for so many other people. Nice. Well, and you have a raving fan here. Um, he was on our program before. Uh, Brent from, well, originally from Vancouver and now based in Toronto, if I remember correctly. Yep. So, uh, thanks for tuning in. <laughs> now, um, Tracy, you said you, you did this move from Nigeria. So, uh, I mean, some of our audience may have had work experience in Nigeria, but for, for those of us who... Uh, have very little experience with with Africa or sub uh, sub Saharan Africa. How different is career planning? I mean, Nigeria is an English speaking country. I'm, I'm going to be very I'm going to be yeah. a tongue in cheek devil's advocate here. Isn't Nigeria an English speaking country? How hard can it be to remake your career going into North America? Come on. So, well, how would you describe <laughs> those those experiences? Uh, so, for me. Um, so I would take that from, I'll, I'll use both uh, two different approaches. So my personal experience, and then of course, uh, giving you like the uh, work experience itself. So Nigeria is the largest uh, black population in Africa. And um, there are over 220 million people in Nigeria. It's an English speaking country, um, it was colonized by the British. So a lot of the style, um, uh, when it comes to phrases, when it comes to spelling, like communication, it's like British standard. And then North America is North America. So uh, that's one thing. Um, right. However, like research has shown that there's so many cultural values that apply to different countries. So if we were to use Nigeria as an example, number one, the work style, um, how people view their work, uh, the communication style, like I mentioned, um, the collaboration and uh, how people collaborate, um, the thought process, so what goes into you making a decision, um, what are the back channels and all of the, you know, uh, bureaucracy that goes into decision making process. And then the mm -hmm. task orientation and the negotiation mm -hmm. styles. So those are like main cultural values that any country would experience, uh, not just talking about Nigeria, but if let's say you move from uh, any part of Euro, um, Europe to North America, you would experience some of these variations in the cultural values. And that would definitely bleed into your work style, um, how you manage your team, how you deal with your bosses or like the management. Um, so all of that is different, even if you're coming from a HQ. So like you're coming from a main office and moving to a different division, there's gonna be a lot of differences. Fantastic. So I, I was just thinking as you were talking, you mentioned the right at the start, you mentioned foreign educated, foreign trained. So that, that word foreign educated, foreign trained. I think that's, a, that's yeah. obviously that message that people have to get across, right? They have to be able to translate what they've learned in a foreign context, even though it might be the same function. 
but but learn but having learned it in a different context and then having to translate that into the context of the place that they're working in so i mean that's 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 pretty that gets down to some pretty kind of core technical skills do you do you find yourself that um you're asking them to, to or, or working with technical people in that particular field of work? Um, or are you, uh, how, how are you kind of encouraging people to, I mean, at least, you know, they, they, they've really got to advertise themselves, haven't they? They've got to translate those skills and their ability to do so in the new language or the new culture they're in. So how, how, how deep do you go into the actual physical technical part of it? Yes, thank you, Brett. That's a great question. The truth is, um, no matter how like trained you are or the skill sets you have, when you move to a new location, you always have to give context. You always have to give context. And I think you mentioned that when we were talking about like foreign trained. So, uh, and I will give you an example. So like for certain roles, uh, maybe the title itself, you're doing, like if you look at the core task, you're doing the exact same thing but the uh, title might be so different. And yeah. that might uh, be a hint to you getting more opportunities just because that title is different. So if you're able to uh, bring context into whatever skill sets you have and uh, apply that to um, the role that you're aiming for or the new role that you're going to be starting as. So let's say you start work, today's your first day at work with a new team and um, you wear a, uh, so like in the UK or in Europe, like when you're an executive, it means like it's a more senior position. In North America, when you say like you're an executive or an associate, it's a more junior position. <laughs> so you see how sometimes you don't put that context and you go out there and say, yeah, I was an executive, I managed a team of 50 people. And the person you're speaking on the other end is saying, how could you be an executive and you are managing 50 people? That's not possible. Or they might even think that maybe you're far reaching or you're, you know, you're not saying the truth. Um, so that's how context plays a, a key role in mm. um, how you want to plan and evolve your career when you decide to move abroad. So for a lot of technical skill holders where you, you maybe you're an engineer or you're in a different uh, field of business, before you start reaching out, sending your resume, doing things like that, take a time to do like a, a career mapping to to look at what the market in this new location, what it is, re what is required of you, and then look at your skill sets to see the skills that you have and the things you've done. So projects you've done, relevant projects, uh, to what you've done, to where you're heading to, and then select those relevant projects. They don't have to know the whole story. Like you have to paint a picture, like a painter, paint a great picture of the relevant projects that you've done that applies when you use it in context of your new location. Mm. Okay. So I, I heard you mentioning career mapping and resumes. So is that something that you help your clients with? You, you sit down with them and say, okay, um, what's been your career trajectory in another location? What, what do you have in mind for your professional future here in this new location? And then you help them re, rework their resumes or how, how, how do you apply your knowledge of what, what, if I were somebody who needed to rehash my career in 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 Canada, what would be some of the first steps you would take me through? Yes, so um, that is a, a huge uh, thing that we do. Some people just come in for uh, resumes. We do not just do only resumes because you find out that when you are starting over in a new location, you, like your resume is not enough. Why? Because maybe you've built a breadth of experience over 15, 20 years, and a two-page piece of paper cannot tell the full story right. of your expertise right. and the things you bring to the table. So we, we uh, do a deep dive, uh, spend more time in really finding out the projects you've done, the relevant projects, doing that career mapping, and then also looking at your digital footprint. Now we live in a digital world where whether we are commenting or posting on LinkedIn or not, whether we uh, like make a, a intentional a way to put out content that shows our professional expertise, whether we're doing that or not, 
Google and other uh, uh, social media platforms, they're picking on our history and the things that we do online. So what happens is when you move to a new location, before you even start reaching out for opportunities, people will go check you out to see, okay, what have you done in the past that shows anything uh, about your experience? And now how can you own that narrative instead of just waiting for whatever pops up, whatever Google brings up <laughs> for you right. to see? So um, we do the whole gamut of not just the resume, um, but the career mapping of at least picking three skill, uh, three career paths of the area you want to focus on, um, and then um, seeing what skill sets that you have, um, if you need to get a recertification for any any of those skill sets, or which one would give you the easiest um, foot in the door before you get more certification. Then mm -hmm. we can talk about the resume, and then we build a digital footprint for you, where somewhere online you have a career portfolio that shows your skill sets that shows the project you've worked on, and then also optimizing your LinkedIn as well to start attracting people locally in that new environment that you're in. Because that's who, that's who you want to find you, not like people from your previous location, because mm -hmm. now you are now in a new environment in a new location. I, 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 like, the, I like the phrase, owning, owning the narrative. That, that, uh, that was a good one. I like that. Which yeah. is... It sounds easy, and I think not enough people are taking active control of the online narrative that can be told with the data that's available. And um, so I'm, I'm happy to hear that you're making that a, a focus of your of your work. I think the most people that that's a really great um, way to. I guess push back against particular stereotypes that that people might have of the culture you come from. You know that's mm -hmm. important, right? Their their perception when we're working with clients, we're asking them right at the start, what is your perception of the place you're going to? And oftentimes they will turn the question on us and they'll say, "But what do they think of me? what will they think of me?" I know there are certain stereotypes that people in the rest of the world hold of my culture. Um, I particularly, I know that some of them are true, just like all stereotypes, rooted in some basis of truth, but everybody's an individual. So that's an important point, isn't it? That um, it, it just, to, just to kind of uh, let people think what they want to think is not really a, a, an approach. It's a very kind of passive approach. You've got to be really proactive in taking, taking control of them seeing you as a person, right? And and also you as a person, and also what your goals and aspirations are, correct? Yeah. Definitely, definitely. It is so important. Like you cannot leave it to chance. Um, and I will say, I would not, you know, hide by the fact that I'm a black woman um, and, you know, just being in that intersectionality where, um, where people immediately get, surprised when they hear you uh you bring up a conversation and you're talking and they're like oh my god you said you moved from did you say you moved from nigeria and you speak this kind of english um yeah. just because of that stereotype as well so when i tell my clients to do certain things or you know because of the a caliber of clients i've worked with in the past and they feel that maybe it's not important you know maybe we should just brush over that and move on because I have also experienced it myself and it's always better to own that narrative and take charge of what they can find about you that corroborates that story. So mm. for every new information we hear, um, our brain always wants to either accept that story or negate that story. So accept the story in the sense that, oh yeah, I knew like he was going to be a smart person, like he was going to be the right person for the role. I just needed to collaborate, like corroborate that story. So mm. if they go on your LinkedIn, is there anything that can corroborate that story? Or is there anything that would um, speak to their group think or their um, their preconceived notions about, nah, I don't think I, like mm -hmm. you can do that job or like, I don't think he's the right person for that. So don't give people that chance to just judge you based on whatever notions of you know that they have um but you taking ownership and putting your best foot forward and then let it be that at least you've done your best you've you know you have covered all the bases 
and then it makes it easier for people to start coming to you. So you're not the one doing the chasing. Um, they now come to you because of the things that they've seen uh, that you have right. done in the past. Right. Now, if you allow me, I'd like to shift gears a little bit into, or change direction a little bit into Nigeria because some of the stereotypes that um, the quote unquote Western world has of West Africa may or may not be true. And um, we've, we've had this topic on, on this program before with other guests that have West, West African roots. So N Nigeria is yes, the biggest economy and the biggest country by population in, in Africa. And yet it is far from being a homogenous culture. Wouldn't you agree, Tracy? Oh yes, definitely. There are over 260 languages spoken in Nigeria. Of course, English is the official language. And um, there are about six geopolitical zones that have like, uh, different ethnic groups that a lot of people identify with, apart from like the other languages that are spoken. So yes, um, it's not a monolithic culture. Mm -hmm. um, it's, and that's the same thing too that applies with black people all over the world or even like Europeans all over the world where you cannot just say because this person is from this part of the world, this is how everybody else behaves. Um, mm -hmm. So um, yes, uh, Nigeria is very diverse. Um, and of course, even though it's rich in resources, there's still so many other uh, parts of the, of the culture um, that is still far behind in terms of like the leadership and things like that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go all political, but um, every country, like when you finally move to any lo any location or any country, then you begin to see a uh, deeper aspect of whatever permeates in that culture, or in that country. Um, so mm -hmm. if before anybody decides to um, just put a blank slate on any country or any culture, um, really try to immerse yourself, uh, which you can do now. Technology has made it so easy um, by reading um, reading books about the place, finding out authors of the place. Um, uh, Chiamanda Adichie is a very popular Nigerian uh, writer, and she's originally from Nigeria. She's reading books. She's giving uh, speeches, different parts of the U.S. and the world. She's won too many prizes. So um, just so read out about. I, think, I, think I, I didn't hear the, the name of the author. Can, can you repeat the name of the author? Oh, Chiamanda. Chiamanda Adichie, yes. Okay, thank she you. She wrote Half of a Yellow Sun. Mm -hmm. Nice. Now, yeah. you see there, there, there are six big geopolitical zones in Nigeria. I think mo most, most people outside of Africa have no idea what you're talking about. Um, I'm, I'm, and that includes me. So the, the the three the three major ethnic groups in Nigeria that I'm familiar with uh, Yoruba, Igbo, and Hausa. But what am I missing? Yes, you're missing anything. Um, so the those are the three major ethnic groups that, like, off the top of your head, like if you if you come to Nigeria, those are the three main ethnic groups you would find. Um, and the six geopolitical zones are like the the north is the southwest the north you know that's how uh, most of them most of the uh, country lines are divided um and like for me i am from the south uh, but my husband is from, from the west and he's yoruba so that's why my last name is a uh, so that yeah so that's the difference you would see uh, and a lot of the culture some of the cultural nuances like when you come to the capital um, or the previous capital, which was Lagos before Abuja, so like say New York and then DC, you would see that there are different, um, there are different cultural nuances. And then when you move to other parts of uh, the country, there are other cultural nuances that uh, different cultures have. Hmm. Thank you for that. And and Brett was <laughs> enough to, to create a banner here. So here's the name of the author of the book that you mentioned. Say say her name again because I'm sure going yes. to butcher the pronunciation. Chimamanda. So it's an Igbo name. So she's from the east. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Adichie. Ngozi Adichie. Right. See, well, wasn't that hard? Excellent. And <laughs> yeah. we. We, we have a, uh, a question from our friend in Toronto. Brent asks, how do the career narratives that you help your clients construct differ for expats on shorter assignments versus immigrants? So 
Are there different narratives for immigrants versus expatriates? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, actually, like when I started uh, coaching and then in corporate doing trainings, it was um, mainly for short term experts. And then um, it gradually evolved into uh, for also immigrants. There's a slight difference um, for experts. They already know, like at the back of their mind, that they probably have an end date of when they're going to go back to their home country. Um, but the emotions are the same. So for any expat that is moving, you go through the excitement, the honeymoon phase, and then you go through the withdrawal phase where you're thinking, did I make a mistake? And then you go through the resistance where you're like, um, I think I want to go back. And mm -hmm. then you finally get to that phase mm -hmm. where you need to find your rhythm, find your balance. And guess what? When you're ready to go back to your uh, home country, you will experience all of these feelings all over again. So the training, the support, it's, it's, it's still, you know, you're still gonna experience all of these feelings where you will still need that support. Um, and like for repatriation, when you go back, where if you notice, maybe if you've hung around anybody that has been an expert and then they move and like they cannot finish a sentence with like, oh, like where I used to live before, we used to do this. Where, where, you know, where I came from, we used to do this. Like, where is it? And you're like, oh my God. <laughs> so, um, so, what I'm just trying to say is that um, the um, building your career narrative as an expert, yes, it is slightly different from an immigrant because there's an end date. You know, you're going to move. For an immigrant, they know that, like, they're going to be in this country maybe for the longest part of their working lives. So maybe by the time they need to uh, move to uh, move back home, they're probably retired. They just want to spend time with family. Um, and that's how you can rate that. But every other thing is the same for your career narr narrative. Um, but for an expert, you know that there is an end date. And um, the team that you're going to be working with, they probably know that within three to five years, you might leave. So some people are not as invested as an immigrant will be where their working lives, they know they might spend the greater part of their working lives in that country. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Right. Yeah. So how do people find you, Tracy? We, we know the podcast is called, is the podcast called Visible at Work as well? Yes, it is called Visible at Work, yes. So, so that, that's what you want to look for, folks. So if you want to connect with Tracy, if you want to find out more about the work that she does, visible at work is the search term you want to put in all of your search bars, whether it's here on YouTube or on LinkedIn or on Facebook or wherever in the world. Maybe you ask Google. I don't know. Maybe you use Bing. Maybe you're one of the three people in the world who still use Yahoo. Or I don't know. What else? Is that? So you use visible at work that that's uh, all all paths lead to tracy when you look uh, for for that uh, for that search term yeah the website too is visibleatwork.com um so you can find us there i have a, a free guide that uh you any of the listeners can download where it breaks down the five steps to plan your career abroad nice. it's uh just type in visibleatwork.com forward slash start s-t-e-r-t and you can download the book um, and just implement. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Tracy, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for coming on today. Thank you for um, doing this early. I know you're on the West Coast of North America. It was, a, I don't know when your day starts, but it's still an early an early program to be on and, and, and talk to us. Really appreciate your time. And Brett, any final thoughts? No, thank you very much, uh, Tracy. I think it's important work. Anybody who needs to or wants to uh, look at what their career path is, this is uh, oftentimes, you know, we, we think that our company is going to take care of it, right? Uh, and mm. we, we always encourage people to be very proactive. So um, it's great work, Tracy. Thank you for the work you're doing, and we really appreciate you being here today. Thanks, Christian, and thank you, Brett. I had a great time. Thank you, everyone. Okay, guys. It's <laughs>
Perhaps Many Cultures, um, episode 137, right? Yeah, something like that. Thanks, so, yes. <laughs> And uh, we'll be back with another episode tomorrow. Stay tuned. Um, if you like what you hear, please subscribe to our, um, uh, as well as subscribing to Tracy's podcast, subscribe to our YouTube channels and uh, and stick around for great every daily content here. Yeah, well, follow the socials. You see oh, them moving so, down yeah. here. Right there, yeah. yeah, and we're on Clubhouse. We've just discovered Clubhouse. Um, if you know if the, if this app lives and you're watching this ten years into the future and you don't know what Clubhouse is, um, <laughs> it's either been a raging, it's uh, been a complete failure or a raging success. So another uh, or drop in audible app that we're we're just trying out. So Clubhouse is another thing you might want to try. We might put, we might do a whole episode on that one day, but we'll see. Um, all right, on the, on the scroll bar here. All yeah, right. yeah, just another thing to add, right? Thank you very much, Tracy. And uh, it's two chaps, many cultures. We are out for today. See you tomorrow. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.